My name is Roy Henry Vickers. I'm Tsim Shen, Haida, Hailstuk, and English. And I uh, have the good fortune of coming back to this beautiful country at the Skeena River. We call Xien in our language, juice from the clouds. And it's taken me 40 years to come back here, but I'm not leaving. My high school art teacher, his name was William West. My, one of my sons, William's named after him. He was a man with, with incredible vision. He was a frustrated artist. Um, and what he, the way he put it to me was, if you want to be a well-known artist, then you have to get to know yourself and you have to express yourself. And so this teacher knew because he asked lots of questions of me. He knew that I had a deep, burning passion to learn about my people, my father's people's art. So he let me go to the Museum of Anthropology. He let me go to the old museum in Victoria. He let me go to the Victoria Public Library because there wasn't a book on Indian art in our school. And in the public library, I had to go into the reference section to look at books that they wouldn't even let be taken out of the library. That's how valuable they were. And so I began this quest for knowledge of the art of the Northwest Coast that just was fed by my teacher in his trust and knowledge that this young boy is going to go and study and he's going to come back to this classroom and he's going to give us a report on what he's learned. So my art teacher made me a teacher to my art class. I was his assistant to my own art class. I got an A+. Plus. <laughs> Only A+, plus I ever got in school. But what he realized years later, he, he's still a friend of mine, he's blind now, but Mr. West, he can tell you the progression of this student. I was the only Indian kid in the school, so he knew that this, this young boy here has, has an experience that nobody in his world probably has. And what I realized was I was the first child from our village to graduate from high school. So he was right. So he had this vision. And so he said to me, you will, you will study, you've already demonstrated, you are going to study whatever inspires you. You've already shown and you've, be, you've already taught your peers in the art class what you're learning. And so you just go on and study whatever moves you. And so he was, he really took me and set me on the course of the quest for knowledge. And that, that I mean, that's what school should be all about. If somehow we could give our educators the freedom to inspire by their lives, like my art teacher did with me, there would be so many kids <laughs> who just couldn't help but learn who just couldn't help but go charging out there into the big unknown world full of awe for whatever there was to learn. So that teacher gave me the desire to teach, which is really why I became an artist, a commercial artist or a professional artist because there are still so many people out there with an ignorance to the ways of our people, with an ignorance to the beauty and the strength and the truth of people who are connected to the land in a way that, that everybody should be. And so, you know, the reason I'm sitting here talking to you is, is because that's what I've learned and that's why I do what I do is, is uh, 
you know if there is a, a, a great joy in doing what you're doing, then that can be imparted to others. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And that art teacher stayed a friend of mine. He actually said to me at this time, if you can stay true to who you are, if you can discover who you are and express that uniqueness that no one else has, somebody one day will look up at the sky and say, there's a Roy Vickers guy. There's Roy Vickers water. Because you will, in your strength and your pureness and your beauty and your awe of what you're seeing, you will be able to passionately give that, communicate that. And when you do, people will take it and it will become so much a part of their lives that that's what they'll say. And w when you get to that place, you will, you will have this uh, satisfaction that nothing, you cannot get it anywhere else but by being truthful, by staying true. And so here I am looking at 60 years and uh, having that experience many times over. That's where I spent most of my life, on the land and with the people, and on the rivers, and in the rain and in the snow, and all of the seasons of the year, and it's where I feel the most at home, anywhere, within 200 miles of where we're sitting right now. When I was a child growing up, I climbed on these big wooden things, Nobody told me they were totem poles. Nobody said, those are sacred, don't climb on those. But I loved them. I climb on them and feel them, look at them. But I didn't, it was part of my life. I, I grew up in the old way in that as a child, I spent time with my dad's dad. And in the old days, when there were nothing but big houses here and no white people here yet, the, the caregivers were mostly the grandparents. And grandparents were young, you know, they were my age. And, and the, the mothers and fathers were really young, like 18, 19 years old when you're, when you're having children. So you're really, there. they were the food gatherers. So the children were always left with the grandparents. Well, at eight, nine, ten years of age, I went with my grandfather all the time because my dad was never around. I never ever saw him. And I used to love being with him because all of his stories were really funny stories about himself. And yet he, he could be laughing, but at the same time he was totally in tune with the whole world around him. He knew what was going on, what the wind was doing, everything was all going into his computer and his head. And, and yet he could tell stories about himself. And what I learned was to look, to look, just look. What do you see? What do you, what do you see? You see anything out there? Yeah, I see lots. Yeah, we say yeah in our language. So those early years with Grandpa, they were on the fishing boat. I'd go to the trap line, and I remember sitting sometimes and seeing his tracks in the snow. If he was going a long ways, he wouldn't take me because I couldn't keep up to him, so I'd just sit and wait on the boat. And I remember snow coming down so heavy, and the, all of the ocean, all of the water in the bay where we were anchored was kind of grayish-white, because the, the snow, it was cold enough, it didn't just melt into the ocean, and his tracks would disappear up in the woods. But I wasn't scared. I just, I loved that quietness. Well, I still do. And I still hear this old man's voice, Xian, juice from the clouds. So it's the snow that's falling right now, that's juice from the clouds. It's the mist that comes when, when the temperatures mix together and, and the mist goes into the river. It's the rain that falls. It's the juice from the clouds. So I look at the river, it's not just a river, it's 
It's mm. alive. It's the life of the people. It's why the villages have been here for thousands of years. And so all of those things go through my mind. And you never know where they're going to come from. They're just They come from everywhere. And I believe that this has happened to me. And I believe that I'm able to to cross over from the old ways to today. And what do we do it for? You know, what do you do what you do for? To communicate to other people. And, and if you can give it to the generations who are following you, then they will have it. Because the experience that we have, when we give that to someone else, it becomes their experience. And when that happens, it's them. It's theirs. It's in their spirit. It goes deep inside, goes into that computer in their brain. And one day when they're looking for something, what you said will come back to them or what you taught them will come back to them. When the pupil's ready, the teacher will come. Most of the time we're, we're gone somewhere else, maybe into the great mystery, but we're not here. M most of my teachers, when I was ready to hear, when they finally came to me into my spirit, they were dead, but I, I learned. To me, that, that's what the art is. It's, it, it's part of us. It's just part of us. It's difficult for me to become academic about it. I leave that to an art historian or an anthropologist or an ethnologist or someone who, who can look at it and dissect it that way. I, it's not possible for me to do that. It's just part of me. I'm connected to it. All of my ancestors who ever drew or sculpted or sang or danced, there that's what's coming through me. That's where I go when when I draw an ovoid. I don't care where it comes from. I don't care if it if it looks like the end of a loaf of bread when you cut the loaf of bread. It's a waste of time to go there for me. Maybe it's interesting to someone else, but it's not interesting to me. It's alive. It's 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 like that. Tzu, we say tzu ni. It's really big. You know, it's bigger than the sum of its parts. When I'm drawing, I come from another place, and half the time I don't know where it is. It's just a wonderful place to be and everything is flowing, and the inspiration is what's guiding me. And I just let it go, and I just don't argue, just do this, just do it. Just listen, Roy, and just do this. Okay. And so when it's finished, I walk away, and I come back two days later, and I look at it, and I go, Whew. wow, that is incredible. And I know where that came from. I know where that came from. And sometimes it's 40 years ago. Sometimes it's a little kid sitting down on Eagle Rock wondering if he could ever do that. But I have to go away and come back and look at it because it's too awesome to look at it when you've just finished it. biggest pitfall for a creative artist who is a professional who makes their living, you know, making money, first of all is you can fall in love with the money. Well, if you fall in love with the money, then you sell out. You sell out. And I didn't think that would ever happen to me because I never wanted to sell out to, to for everything to be about money. <clears throat> so early in my, when I realized everything is precious and you should never, you know, whatever the price is, is what you agree on. It's priceless, but that's okay. You, you have to take some money to pay the mortgage and look after your family. So when I learned how everything works, then I never ever worried about how much money I was going to make. What I always 
was afraid of was, am I going to do this because I think it's going to sell? That's selling out. So, here's Roy. $1.2 million a year. Piss drunk. Standing down in the dock, crying his eyes out. Just bawling. Why? He's lost. He lost his way. Well, what happened? Well, he didn't know what to do with all the money. He didn't feel worthy of all of the adulation and attention. It got to him. He believed it. He believed he was fantastic in other people's eyes. He didn't believe it himself. He never saw it. He couldn't look in the mirror every day and love that guy. He looked in the mirror every day and couldn't stand that liar. Couldn't stand seeing that person so lost, who was so full of bullshit. Oh, but his work is beautiful. Yeah, it is. When is he going to see it? So, the drunk that I was always had the desire to be beautiful. I didn't, nobody told me that I was beautiful. Nobody gave me the ability to look in the mirror and see beauty. Not my mom, not my dad, not my wonderful grandfather who taught me so many things. He looked in the mirror and he didn't see beauty. I didn't learn it from him. I didn't learn it from the priest that I loved to go and spend so many hours with. I didn't live, learn it from the Pentecostal born-again speaking in tongues minister who brought me to Christ and an understanding of what born-again is. I didn't learn it there. Where did I learn it? I learned it from wanting to have it and asking the Creator, can you please? Show me the way. And therein lies the ability for us in this day and age to know the old ways. Sometimes I'll sit down with a blank piece of paper and a blank mind and say, well, it's time to go to work. Yeah, well, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what are you going to do? Well, I don't know. It's a great mystery, isn't it? So I'll sit down and look at the paper, and away I go. And you just stop and listen, pay attention. Boom! Explosion! Magic! Where did that come from? Back here somewhere, way back here. I don't know. Maybe it came from an ancestor. Maybe it came straight from the Creator. Maybe it came from a part of my memory I can't even remember right now, in my subconscious, and I'll figure it out somehow. It'll come to me, but right now it doesn't matter. Just there it is. Well, there is this one teacher of mine, an angel, who said to me, when you're standing in the strength and the truth and the beauty of who you are, all of your ancestors on the other side are standing behind you. And they're saying to each other in an awesome, whispering, excited voice, Maybe this one will be the one. Maybe this one will be the one. Maybe this one will be the one to bring forth the strength and the truth and beauty of our lineage. Maybe this one will be the one. Oh, how old?